There are several things that build the understanding, the reason why many have gone lawless, and the reason why the presence of God does not dwell as it should, and many who think that it does. If you look as the Lord, I was praying, it was the other day. If you look at the word of God, that the word of God declared that slavery was okay. Yeah, it does. It does. Moses declared that to be a slave and to be a slave owner was within the context of the makeup of God's program. And God himself in Genesis chapter 13 spoke to Moses and told him that your children, your, your, your descendants will be slaves to a people for 400 years in Egypt. God spoke slavery himself and approved of it. I remember before I took my journey to South Africa and I was reading, I forget the name of the writer, and I was quite prolific, Red Leaves, Red Dust on Green Leaves. Elizabeth, I don't know if you remember that book. And uh, who talked about how the Africanas made the Zulu, little Zulu boys like this sit on a red hot stove to punish them and their opposition to apartheid. And I told the teacher and, 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 and leader on our way to South Africa, that I don't know if I can make it in South Africa. I don't know if I'm not gonna explode with anger at the Africana's treatment to the Zulus there. But I was sent there to learn about religion and social order. And I got through South Africa with some rebellion too, by the way, to the past laws. I said, I ain't doing nothing these white people tell me to do. I was a renegade down in South Africa. I didn't get arrested, I'm back. But slavery has been ordained of God. And one of the things I've said about South Africa is, listen, the Zulus lost the battle to the Africans. They lost. Over a period of over 100 years, the Zulus and the Africanas the Africana came down to Transvaal. The Transvaal is the middle part. South Africa is the largest nation in Africa. It's at the very bottom of Africa. And in the middle of it is a, a highway that's cut apart and jungle on either side. The Transvaal is how the Africanas, the Dutch Africanas, came down from many of the other colonized nations into South Africa, into Johannesburg, Pretoria, and Cape Town. So I have said the Transvaal. And the Zulus beat them back time after time. But once they came again, and the Africanas beat the Zulus and took over the government. And that was what happened. And so I've been hated by many of my brethren, and perhaps many of you who don't understand, that God said that the Jews would be slaves for 400 years in Egypt. And those Negro and colored people, and cannot understand why I would condone slavery. I don't, I just condone what the word of God says. But can I share something with you where the Lord says that we have kept the word of his patience, that we've waited on him and we've not been discouraged by the fact that the word promotes and opens up the opportunity for Jews to be slaves. The thing I think is significant about this is that they were slaves to my father, Ham. My father who was a Pharaoh, my father, the pharaohs, the builders of Egypt and all of his great wonders. The Jews were slaves to my father, Ham, the pharaohs. And the unique thing about the Jews being slaves to my father, Ham, the pharaoh, is that the pharaohs treated the Jews with some sense of equality. Let them have their own place to stay out in Goshen. And none of the brutality, while at the end of the time when the pressure began to be put on Pharaoh about the Jews, and Pharaoh told them, to, told, tell them to make brick without straw. Okay, but nothing like the brutality that Japheth had against slaves in the cabins of South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and otherwise. In essence, the Egyptians were quite cordial to the Jewish slaves. They were quite cordial to them. They're, there's not a historical sense of their brutality, and according to the scriptures that, that Moses had laid out. 
and Moses himself had overseen that. So I think it's, worth, it's noteworthy. And not only that, a lot of people say, well, you know, the, the Pharaohs, the Hamites built the, built the pyramids and the Sphinx and all the other great wonders that they built there in Egypt by using slave labor of the Jews. Well, that's not a bad thing. So it's not, not a bad thing if, if my father, Ham, was able to use the Jews to build the pyramids, which is not true. They were not built by the Jews. They weren't so much so much as built by Pharaoh. Uh, and by the way, we're going to Egypt in April, I think it is, and we'll talk more about that process. Of the, but my point here now is that it was a cooperative effort that they worked together. And then finally, God set them free, but trained them. They got trained in slavery how to be a great and a noble people. Well, slavery is not the end of the world. You'll even remember when God caused uh, Nebuchadnezzar to ride into Judah and take away captive Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and put them in captivity for seven years in Babylon. It wasn't a time of brutality except when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego decided they weren't going to bow down to the great image. They were thrown into the fiery furnace. But God was with them then. A Daniel and the lions there. It wasn't a sense of brutality like the white folk did the black folk from Africa here in America. It's a different type of slavery. And I have been patient. I've been patient. I've been patient on this word that God has given to me. I've waited. I'm going to keep on waiting. I understand the miseducation. I understand the lawlessness of where we are. And if you're going to serve as an elder in this church, you're going to have to understand that as well. It can potentially never, you could potentially never have the amount of membrane in your brain to ever find a place to logically look and deduce and understand what I just explained to you. You may never have the capillaries in your heart or your blood system or your aorta may never be large enough. There may never be room enough in your heart to understand what I just explained to you is that I understand slavery and that God said it was okay for it to happen, not brutality. You may never understand that. And as a result of it, never understand how to truly love God, how to truly come to him and love his word. And so as a result of it, you may see me as one that's not a brother. Ain't no black man. He don't love the black folk. He ain't down with the black movement because you can't see it. There is no capacity in your mental understanding. There is no development. You have not developed your exercise of your brain enough to go that deep into the power of God's word to appreciate that. The, the problem with the Negro, and you brothers are gonna have to understand that, the Negro man, the one that walks by this church and hates me, or the people who go to church, but on the, their ability, their, their intellectual strengths are not strong enough to understand the scripture. <laughs> they, they, they're not intellectually capable. Intellectually, they don't have the ability to advance to that. So they're nubbed, they're snubbed, and they act like dummies. They act out violence and hatred at God's word simply because they're they perish for a lack of knowledge. They perish for a lack of social, intellectual development to know God said it. And in Babylon, God sent them back home after 70 years for he had proclaimed it. So if you're gonna serve in this church, all the people, well, hey, he, he don't love the black man. <laughs> he, 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 ain't for the, he ain't for the black man. He a hate preacher, you see. It isn't just their lust, it's their ignorance. One of the things about writing the scripture is that it helps develop a region and a section of your brain that normally does not get developed. And as we grow, we get educated on various things and a segment of our brain, maybe three to 7% of it develops and then we understand it and we use it routinely every day. But it's a percentage of it that does not get developed. And so certain types of training will stimulate brain activity and will stimulate intellectual strength. I told the men the other day, I said, I pity y'all because I was raised in North Carolina. I walked barefoot. You don't know what it is to walk barefoot in fresh plowed ground. 
it's like you're a plant standing in the midst of, and you're gonna grow in just a moment. It's so exhilarating. The ground is freshly plowed. Or to look up and there's no smog in the sky. There's no smoke anywhere. And the air is always fresh. In early spring, you can smell the honeysuckles growing on backyard fences. It's just uh, the smell of honeysuckle. It's intoxicating, and you smell it at night while you sleep. It's not something somebody sprays in the air. You don't need a house spray. Honeysuckle comes right in. Or learn to work to develop your muscles, carry buckets of water, bales of cotton, to pick, to grow, to run, to fight, to ride horses, to wrestle with goats. All of that develops several segments of your senses, your smell, your idea. You grow up among garbage cans in the projects in New York City, and all you are is a garbage can. You're not much more than Mr. Cookie on the, the what they call it, the program that they have, the Muppets. And you're not the same. You're not the same. And when people come from Africa, and they've grown up with no indoor plumbing, they've grown up in the jungles, they have a different intellectual strength. They have a different appreciation. They look at you here in America as American Negroes and don't even want to be a part of you because you are not intellectually strong. And the church is worse. They don't understand the scripture and they call me a hater. If you're going to stand in this church, you got to realize they just aren't as smart. They just don't know the word of God. They're ignorant and they suffer and they perish because they're ignorant. I'm not a bad preacher. I'm not a bad man. They just don't have the intellectual development of what I just explained to you in scripture. This is a bit of a news blog we do, looking at spiritual wickedness in high places for the most part, making uh, some observations about it and giving people a biblical foundation to the way of interpreting rather than have uh, uh, Sean Hannity or Laura Ingram or Janine Pirro or Anderson Cooper or Rachel Maydow or Don Lemon. Uh, Rush Limbaugh interpret what's going on in the world. You come to me and I'll tell you based on what the word of God says. They'll just give you their worldly sinful view. But the man will tell you what God has said, whether to say yea or nay, whether to go or to stay. You'll be led by the word of Almighty God. Come to the Manning Report on a daily basis to interpret the spiritual wickedness in high places because there's plenty of it that's going on. And so I am he, I'm the Lord, sir, James David Righteous Rebel Manning. And I'm here to serve you with news and information. <laughs>